I want to say thank you for allowing us the time off. It was absolutely incredible, so thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank my staff and my teaching staff, and I knew they did a great job on Sunday mornings and the volunteers, and it just, I told my wife, it was like such a wonderful feeling to know that the church is in great hands, and you were hearing the word of God, and, and God is moving, and great things are happening, and, and incredible stuff's happening at the Valley Dream Center, and, but I do appreciate us having this time to uh, have some recreation, a restoration, which happens to be the name of our series in July. And when I got back, I was talking to one of my pastor friends, and he goes, oh, I told him the name of my series. He goes, oh, that's just an excuse to talk about your vacation while you're preaching. <laughs> and I said, no, every, I talk about everything I do when I'm preaching. It's like, that's just one more thing I add to my, to my life. And when I, whenever anything happens to a pastor, it's a possible sermon illustration, right? And you just don't want to be one of those sermon illustrations, so be careful <laughs> what you say to me. And I was especially excited about the earthquakes we've been having. My goodness, what, what sh shook me back to reality. How many of you felt it? Let me see. Oh, yeah. How many of you, this is the first time you've felt an earthquake? Yeah, what? <laughs> Jason? Really? Who else? This is the first time. What did you think? Did you like it? <laughs> Okay, you know, just because my brain works this way, I, the first, when, I, when I came back uh, on, on Saturday, I came here because I used to be a builder, and I actually did a physical checkup of the whole building. So I walked through the attics, I looked at the trusses, and, and I just want just to let you know, because there's already been 3,000 aftershocks, and there's a very good chance it will happen while I'm preaching today, which I'll do an immediate altar call when that happens, by the way. <laughs> And let you know, we have a protocol, and I haven't talked about this, but I, I just had a meeting with some of our volunteer teachers uh, and some of our volunteers. In case we get uncomfortable in the building with anything that happens that we have to evacuate, the protocol, everybody understands, and you need to know it too, that if we have to leave the building, we go out that door to my left, your right, to the courtyard, out to the grassy area, the field, the grassy field on the west side of the property. Your children and the teachers will meet you there. So if anything ever happens and there's something that we have to leave the building for, just know you don't have to run and get your children. They will meet you on the grass. And that's where we're all going to go in case that happens after the altar call. Well, as soon as I know you're all saved, then we'll, we'll leave the building. But it does, you know, the earthquakes do remind me that the earth is so much like us. I mean, God created the earth and God created us. And we, you, you all know there's these tectonic plates that are moving around, and we have this molten center. And the earth, because it's revolving and orbiting around the sun, the, these tectonic plates are always under tension. And every once in a while, they have to release that tension. Something dynamic happens because we all feel it, and then it settles down for a while. And the earth is broken like everything else, waiting for the return of Christ. And in our lives, God does the same thing. We have this tension in our lives. And then something breaks, and then we're at peace. And this whole month, when we talk about recreation and restoration, it is to prepare us for some time with God, for a breaking to happen, and something powerful to occur. And so the first part is, are we willing to even believe that we need some kind of recreation and restoration in our life? And many of you may have had parents like mine or fathers like mine or bosses like mine that would say things like, you can rest when you're dead. You ever had that? someone say that to you? You can rest when you're dead. Well, of course, you're dead. But if you don't rest, you get dead sooner, okay? So we have this work ethic that we've been taught and if you trace it back, it's so interesting when you think about the empires and what people did for recreation. And, oh, hey, beautiful, would you give me that uh, little bag there? I brought you some props. I could not return without some props, so I'm going to bring you some props. But I was doing some research on, thank you, beautiful, on the recreation of empires, of people. And if you trace it back and we look at all the things they found, it's so amazing. How many of you have played this board game, Candyland? If you've been a kid or you have kids, you have grandkids, you're going to play this game. But 5,000 years ago, the most popular game was in Egypt. 
And it was a board game called Senate, and S-E-N-E-T, and it really means, uh, the, the, the little translation of that time meant uh, passing on. It was a life and death game. It was, supposed, it, was like, it was like a combination of checkers, chess, and dungeons and dragons, okay? And it was so popular, the many Egyptians were buried with the board game. Because it was something they did to kind of restore themselves with fun, with fellowship, to keep their brain working. And so they found a way to have a game that took away from the dreariness of the hardships of the day to, get, to give you some fun with other people. Here's another one. You go through history. Sports, right? Sports. Boxing, wrestling, running. All of these sports go back thousands of years. Sports is a way to get your body to relax. We, love, we have so many. Name, name some sports we have today. Shut them out. It goes on and on and on and on. Sports, recreation. It is a way to kind of decompress. And if you're actively in a sport, it gets your body decompressing as recreation. Recreation, even the word, was a medical term at one time. It was used in the late 13th century, early 14th century. Recreation meant to restore, <coughs> excuse me, restore your mind, soul, and body. And so recreation was once a medical term. So it's always been something important. The last one, and some of you are there right now because you're not here at church, the ocean, the beach, right? How many of you love going to the ocean? Yeah, on vacation, we stayed everywhere close to the coast we could. We only came inland when we had to come back to, to Fresno because there's something beautiful about the vast ocean or the mountains. How many like the mountains better? Let me see the mountain. Yeah. So this there's always been, if you do look at some of the manuscripts, people have always had this idea that if you get away, do some traveling to other regions, it is good for your soul. So recreation is necessary. But here is where we run into a problem, and we still carry pieces of this, a flavoring of this today. And during the Protestant Reformation, that occurred because of the corruption and the debauchery of church leaders of the day, of the state-run church. And so because there was so much debauchery, the Protestants created what was called this personal code of conduct, the purity of conduct. I want to read this to you because if you think about this, it was a pendulum swing trying to get people to get out of the uh, using their faith to get political power or to get money or to hoard it over people or to take power over people. And they were trying to get people to get back to the simple life of following Jesus. And in Geneva, 1541, they wrote this purity of conduct and it was expected that you would observe this. And this is how it went. You could never play, they forbid all kinds of card games. No card games, because card games could possibly lead to gambling. So card games were out. Dancing, gone. No dancing. Wearing jewelry or makeup, ladies, nada. Nothing. Evil. Horrible. Singing of happy songs. Poor worship team, what are they going to do, right? Feasting of any kind, drinking, which was really interesting because they used wine for the communion. I don't know how they pulled that one off. And then it said no festivals of any kind. Freedom Fest, nothing. You couldn't have a festival because that was honoring something that was not God. Theaters, none. Uh, ribaldry. Ribaldry is joking. No jokes. I don't know what I would do when I was preaching in that time. Although, this question of whether or not they're funny, but still, it's still a joke. <laughs> Light-hearted poetry or public displays no, uh, displays. no poetry of any kind. It could lead to lust. No works of art. A work of art was considered idolatry and no musical instruments in church. Now, what had happened, I want you to think about, just think logically about what we see. The pendulum went all the way to this side because they were so afraid of doing something immoral. And what happened was it removed from the Christians the ability to distress, 
to relax, to recreate, to be restored. And so they would do things in secret. Do you know there's a city on the coast where they were not allowed to have, in California, they were not allowed to have curtains on their windows. Because they were, you might do something immoral behind that window. And so because of that, in that community, you were not allowed to cover, ever cover your windows. When it got dark, you were supposed to go to bed. Go to bed early, get up early. And so what happened is it created this problem for Christians. That it was okay to work hard, okay to be disciplined, okay to buffet your, buffet your flesh. But if any fun came into the equation, you were in sin. And so it caused a separation between those that knew Christ and those that didn't, and it caused this problem where Christians had to decompress somehow, so they did their sin in secret. And doing the sin in secret is what happens today with so many in the church, is you're afraid that someone might think you're having fun. And so we don't even know what is acceptable fun anymore. What does God think fun is? And, is, and can we do activities like dancing? Can we go to the movies? Can we be with friends? Can we play board games? And what happens is Christians who must decompress from the troubles of the world have nowhere to go but to do it in isolation, which leads to sin. And so I want to kind of take that myth and I want to break that down this month, and I want to show you what God says, especially today what Jesus says, because Jesus was an incredible coach. He was the best coach that ever lived. Even though he was the son of God, when he was raising his disciples up, he was a great coach about this. And so I want to begin in Mark chapter 6. If you have your Bibles there, go to Mark chapter 6. And we're going to talk about how Jesus began to identify some of the stresses and strains of life and then lead these men to a place of rest and recreation so that he might do a greater work in them. And that's where we want to go today. So let me begin in verse 1. Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. He had just left a place in Capernaum and he was doing great miracles. But he, this is the second time he goes back to his hometown. The first time he was there, they tried to throw him off a cliff. Remember, when he came back from being baptized in the water by John, he was tempted for 40 days. He went back to the synagogue in Nazareth, read Isaiah 61, identified himself as the chosen one, and they, they, they basically ran him out of town. But he went back again a second time. So Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom he has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brothers of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. The first point we're going to learn that Jesus is teaching and showing his disciples is that Christ's divinity was questioned and humanity tested every day. From the time he went public with his ministry to the time he was on the cross dying for the sins of humanity, people questioned his divinity and tested his humanity. Even to the point of dying on the cross, they were make, making fun of him. Come down if you're the king. Heal yourself if you're the, the physician. So from the very beginning, he was tested. And he wanted the disciples to see this episode with his hometown. And this was his response. Jesus said to them in verse 4, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do many miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So the first coaching item for the disciples to see was that people who've known you for a long time may not believe 
the great gifts that God has given you can be used for his glory. They may not, may not believe you have the ability to overcome the, your past for the greatness of God's future. And at that time, his own family, his brothers and sisters, thought he was a, he was a nut. They thought he was crazy because they didn't, until he, was, uh, re, re, he rose from the dead, they didn't believe he was the son of God. So here's the first thing Jesus wanted them to see. He is the, he is the son of God. He is performing miracles. He is, uh, Jairus' daughter was dead, and he raised her from the dead just before this happened. And yet he could not do many miracles because they could not see past Jesus the carpenter. Jesus, who had brothers and sisters. And this walk, for G- this walk that we have to follow Christ will come with that constant harassment that comes through, first of all, the enemy, and then those who have known you before Christ. And they will, they will have difficulty seeing you in the light that Christ sees you. They will have difficulty seeing you as the redeemed ambassador that you've called to become. So old friends, relatives, family, some some of you find a struggle. You may be able to walk out your Christianity in your workplace or with your, your life group or at church, but when you go be with family, you feel this pressure. You just feel like you're you're stagnant. That's because they're having difficulty seeing you with the eyes of your creator. And that wears on us. That was difficult for Jesus to see. He was amazed at their lack of faith. And so every one of us has to be prepared that our past is not our future. But our past can be redeemed by Christ to give us the ability to have compassion on others as we walk out our future. God never wastes a hurt. Celebrate recovery line. Anything that happens to you in the past through Christ does not define your future, but God can use it for his glory. And Jesus, don't you, I mean, don't you find it amazing that he would take his disciples to watch him be basically humiliated in front of his family? Right, if you're trying to impress someone, I used to, you know, my parents, uh, you know, when you're at a certain age, you're kind of embarrassed of your parents. It just happens for a while. And then you're like, you, then you think your parents are geniuses when you have kids. Like, how did they do it? So there's that time in the middle where you're a little bit embarrassed. And you don't want to bring your friends to see your parents because maybe they're, they're gregarious or they'll say things or your mother will talk about changing her diapers and you're a baby or something like that, right? And so sometimes you have that place. Well, I, I just find it amazing that Jesus is imparting this ministry to the disciples. And he, he already knows what's going to happen. He brings them to his hometown to watch him be rejected by his own brothers and sisters and his own synagogue and his own people because he knows that these fishermen and these leaders and these tax collectors, they're going to have people looking at them and saying, you're nothing but a tax collector. Why are you telling me about Jesus? You're just a common laborer. You're just a fisherman. He knows they're going to experience this. And the tension of that can rob you of your joy and make you question God's great plan for your future. Jesus is setting this example, and he's going to bring to them opportunity for restoration through this process. And then it goes on, and it says that he does something with them after this happens. He sends them out. So this rejection happens, he leaves, and then it says in Mark chapter 6, Starting in verse 6, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. 
in the midst of this happening, the very next thing he does is sends his disciples out to do the great and mighty works that he did. Which is the second point, God has a spiritual work journey for everyone. God has a spiritual work journey. That means he has something for you to do. He has called you for it. He has equipped you for it. And he wants you to accomplish it. Now, in the average church, less than 5% of the people are actually in full-time ministry. Most people live outside of full-time ministry. So you're raising families, getting education, in a vocation, running a business. You're doing something outside of the church. And in that vocation, in raising that family, in that education, in whatever God's having you do, he has a spiritual work for you to do. The same as he did for the early disciples. Never question that God has a specific plan for you. And by the way, that plan may change because there are seasons in our service to God. He may may have you serve here for a while and do this for a while and do that for a while. There are seasons we go through. But immediately, he sends them out, empowers them. And the very reason you're sitting here today, the very reason I'm standing here today is somebody, after Jesus' death and resurrection, some disciple led someone to Jesus who led someone to Jesus who led someone to Jesus, and that led to someone leading me to Jesus. Generation after generation. And it wasn't just professional or full-time pastors. It was someone in the workplace, a mama praying for her child, a, a man praying for his friend. Someone led someone to Jesus, but it went all the way back to this day. Think about it. You are in the genealogy, family-wise, of this day where Jesus sent his disciples out. That led to you following Christ. And that continues on. And so every one of us has to understand that we are called by God on a spiritual work journey. There's something for you to do. Someone needs the message in your heart, and he has called you, and he will equip you to give it to others. But we haven't even begun yet to start the conversation about recreation and restoration. But I'm doing this intro to let us know that it is not okay if somehow you have been given a Christian idea that rest is bad, recreation is wrong, and having fun is dishonoring. That is not God's heart. I think God had a great time creating the universe Can you imagine how fun it would be to speak a solar system into existence? How cool is that? I feel good when I mow my lawn. He's casting the solar systems into existence. He's making the earth. He's making the garden. I mean, how he had fun. It was enjoyable. It was good. It is okay to have a happy smile on your face and have times where you decompress and you enjoy things for the very just for the sake of enjoying it. I love the ocean. I don't like to be on the ocean. I get motion sickness really bad. I love looking at the ocean. I like smelling the ocean. I do not like to be on the ocean. That's where the fish are supposed to live. That's their place. I don't mess with them. I live on land. Don't mess with me. We have our places, okay? But I love the beauty of the vastness of the ocean and the power of the ocean. But don't underestimate the power of your spiritual journey. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Everything you do is to honor your God. Now Mark 6 throws in this piece. 
and I'm going to just touch on it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's a piece to, again to show the heartbreak of, the, of Jesus having to experience all that we experience in humanity. And it's the part about when Herod and his ego killed his cousin, John the Baptist. And Jesus loved his cousin. His cousin, John the Baptist, is the one who baptized him. He's the one who leapt in his mother's womb when he met Jesus in the womb. He loved his cousin. And so life brings times of distress and disappointment. And Jesus wanted them to know this. And so I find it amazing in several of the gospel messages, it talks in depth about something that had happened. It said that Herod heard about this, what Jesus was doing with the disciples, and they were saying, is this John the Baptist that has been raised from the dead? And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he's Elijah. Others claimed he's a prophet like the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. That was enough. But in this, in this story, they go back to the whole experience of how Herod, as an egotistical evil leader, had his cousin beheaded because of a dancing girl. And he did that again. It's recorded again because I'm sure Jesus had this conversation with the disciples. Sometimes life is going to throw you a curve. You're serving Jesus. You, you may lead someone to Jesus and it's wonderful, and then someone you love suddenly gets cancer, or someone you care about walks away from the Lord, or something happens in a relationship. Sometimes bad things happen in the midst of miracles happening. And so life has times of distress and disappointment. All the more reason to honestly assess the, what happens to you, how tired and weary and fatigued you can become, and the need to understand how God has created a scenario for you to relax, to have peace, to do, do something that brings you joy, and that restores your soul in the medical, recreational way, not cannabis, by the way, but in God's way. What is God, how has God given you things that make you feel at peace and so I find it intriguing in the middle of this chapter, it goes back and gives a story again of a painful experience in Jesus' life when the very one who was obedient and baptized him into his public ministry is murdered for no good reason. All of us will have those experiences sometime in our life. All of us will have these days where you just, Something sideswipes you, and you're like, what did I do wrong, God? Did I do something wrong? Did I sin? What did I do wrong? And you did nothing wrong. Life brings times of distress and disappointment. And the reason we can, we can relate to Jesus so well is because he didn't just come down as a man to die. He came here as a baby in human form, carrying the fullness of the deity within him, so that he would experience every joy and every disappointment that you do. So that he knows the strain and struggles of humanity. He experienced all of them. He was tempted, but he did not sin. That makes the shed blood of the sacrifice of Jesus all the more powerful and beautiful because he experienced all the pain that you have, all the disappointment, all the distress, and yet he gave his life anyway. And that makes his gift and his sacrifice all the more beautiful. And so he sets them up with this. They had just come back from doing this great ministry. He had empowered them. It tells this quick story to remind us of the pain that Jesus faced. And then it goes on to say, starting in verse thirty. In Mark chapter 6, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. And he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. The coach, Jesus, 
saw the fatigue on his disciples. He saw that they were get, even though they had performed great miracles in his name, he could see they were tired. He could see they were worn out. And his first priority was for them to get some rest. For them to have a time of decompression from this overwhelming, crushing need of humanity. Let me ask you a question. This is an honest question. We have embraced our community. We have not run from the problems of, our, of the poverty and the underserved in our community. We have stayed and embraced it. And we do it every day. And great things are happening at the Valley Dream Center. But if you were to sell everything you own today, everything, and take all that cash and feed all the hungry people you could today, would you feed all the hungry people? Would there be hungry people tomorrow? Can you see how overwhelming it can be to serve Christ? If you lead someone to Jesus tomorrow, you know five people who don't know Jesus. You see, this was, this was what Jesus the coach was trying to explain to his disciples. I sent you out with all the power and authority that I have, and you did it. And they were just like, people got healed. People were, you know, demons were cast out. People came to repentance. But then tomorrow, there's more people that need healing. More people that need Jesus. More people that need to come to repentance. And so it says they were crushed on every side. They were popular, but the need never ends. This is the difference between us and God. We can only do our part. God has the master plan. And where are we getting the trouble, and I'm the, the biggest sinner among you, is that we forget that we are just supposed to do our part. I want to do all the parts. And then it falls apart. There is God, and we are not God. And then we are ambassadors of Christ, and we get a mission, a season, a job. And in that mission or that season, our job, we're only supposed to do our little part. God has an entire army to do his work. But Jesus set the expectations early for the disciples. I sent you out, and even though you had great power and great authority and wonderful things happened, you are tired, you are whooped. I can see it in your eyes. You need a break. And he said, take a break. Get some rest. This need's going to be here tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. So what we're, what we're looking at this month is identifying several things. The fact that you have a mission from God. The fact that there will be disappointments in life. And the fact that Jesus will give you specific tasks to do and then rest. And then recreation. And we'll talk more about what God says about rest and recreation. But on the heels of him giving them rest, the, one of the greatest signature miracles happens next. And it's the feeding of the thousands. And it happened after he gave them a time of rest. Do you know that only two miracles are recorded in all four Gospels? the resurrection of Jesus, and the feeding of the thousands. Those are the only two all four Gospels have. Those are the signature miracles of Jesus. And it comes on the heels of them getting rest. I will never finish this message today. And I have, God has given me a few, a few prayers to pray over this time. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there because this story is so cool. It'll take me, it'll take me 40 minutes to tell it. I, I, it's already getting late. But I do want to spend some time praying for you. Here's, here's what I see. I want you to, to, uh, to imagine it with me. Just as we have had a correction in our, on our earth with tectonic plates, and there was this movement 
there was this vibration, and now there is quiet. There are some here today that you are out of order with your work versus rest ratio. And I admit that I was one of them. And being on, finally, I had time enough away to think about my work schedule. But there are, there are some of us that we're forgetting something, that the rest that you, you're supposed to be taking, the recreation you're supposed to be having, will lead you to a greater season with greater miracles and greater power. It is the opposite of what you think. You think if you take some rest and relaxation, you're dishonoring God or you're not taking advantage of things or people will go hungry. It's just the opposite. It is the time of recreation which prepares you for some powerful, miraculous event of the future. And I want to give you a chance to set that right. If you have a chance to do something that causes you to be at peace, whether it's reading, whether it's sports, whether it's music. It is time to begin to add that as a discipline into your life. A discipline into your life. Because that discipline will bring you to future seasons with greater miracles.